<clears throat> hi, hi folks, Webhead back, and today I'm going to talk to you about Warhammer fantasy roleplay, um, a topic that I've been wanting to present for a while, so let's get into it. This review is probably going to be a little bit different, structured a little differently than my uh, normal reviews, just because there's so much to talk about, that uh, I'm really going to break it up to about four parts. The, um, the first part is going to be talking about Warhammer as a setting, specifically, um, not tied to any specific uh, version of the game, per se. The second part will be my review of the second edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and talking about the rules and everything. The third part will be to cover the third edition of Warhammer, the most recent edition released by Fantasy Flight Games. And then finally, um, the fourth part will just be kind of wrap up um, talking about supplements and other resources that I think are very valuable to... Um, GMs and players of Warhammer to get the the most out of the setting, get the most bang for your buck. So let's talk about Warhammer as a setting. Um, it, those of you who aren't familiar with Warhammer may not know that Warhammer started off as a tabletop miniatures battle game back in 1983 by Games Workshop. And it was basically just a skirmish game. Well, I, I don't know if that term is probably technically not right. It started as a war game of pitting uh, battles against armies. And, uh, you know, they created a background for all the different uh, fantasy races that were involved. Well, three years later, in 1986, the Games Workshop decided to publish a role-playing game for it. And then with the role-playing game came additional kind of fleshing out of some of the background materials. Uh, you know, some of the really low-level information that um, wasn't as important maybe on an army scale, but that, you know, was conducive to a role-playing environment. So the two have had a long, rich history together, and, and the two have kind of influenced each other back and forth um, uh, over the course of the various editions, um, the changes to the battle game influencing changes to the, uh, the role-playing game and vice versa. But at the center of either game um, is the Warhammer world, and specifically for the role-playing game, it tends to center around a region of the, of the world called the Old World. And the Old World... Uh, kind of at the center of the attention of the uh, in the old world for the role-playing game is a, call, a place called the Empire, and it's a human empire that was formerly a number of barbarian human tribes that were united under a glorious, magnificent leader by the name of Sigmar, and this was thousands of years ago in the backstory of the of the game. So he united these tribes and he formed a great empire, a lasting legacy. Um, Sigmar himself stepped down and vanished into the wilderness and supposedly ascended to godhood, and so he's worshipped as a god um, within within the human empire. Um, and the so at the present day of the game, the empire kind of represents, uh, or is kind of uh, hearkening back to the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it's kind of like uh, similar to. Um, or often cited as being similar to early Renaissance Germany in a lot of ways. You have some, uh, some basic Renaissance era technologies that are emerging, um, like the printing press had been recently invented, there, there are uh, uh, black powder weapons, um, and that sort of thing, and there's kind of some general social upheaval that's going on uh, with the, you know, an establishment of, the, of a middle class and the lower class, uh, you know, speaking out against the upper class and all this kind of thing. Um, and so it's, so even though on the surface it might appear to be a kind of bog standard, maybe Tolkien-esque fantasy, uh, that, the Renaissance element kind of changes things up a little bit um, in just in terms of the, the feel of the game. And that, um, that um, you have a little bit of different kind of political climate, you have a little bit uh, different uh, kind of uh, that opens up certain plot elements that you couldn't really explore maybe in a more a more medieval standard fantasy fair. Um, so you have the humans, um, as every good role-playing game, or as every good fantasy role-playing game has, um, but you also have the some of your other your other standard fantasy races, your dwarves, who live in the mountainous regions around the Empire, and are sort of ancestrally um, uh, aligned with the humans of the Empire through ancient uh, oaths and that sort of thing. Um, 
And so they represent, uh, they're, they're pretty probably the most closely knit with the humans in terms of, um, you know, integrating them into a game set within the Empire. But you also have um, High Elves and Wood Elves, um, two different sort of branches of Elves, one group of Elves that, that the High Elves kind of being the aloof, standoffish, you know, they live on their, on their secluded island across the sea and they only occasionally send envoys and, and people representatives to the old world and then the wood elves are the elves that you know have chosen to reside in the forests of the old world protecting the woodland creatures and and communing with the spirits and, and all that sort of thing um, but one of the things that makes um, that um, really kind of influences the style and the way that Warhammer is played is that you have these little tiny kind of pockets of civilization even within the empire you have little city kind of city-states, little villages that dot the major roads and rivers here and there. But even within the Empire, and especially surrounding the Empire, are hordes and hordes of different threats. And there are uh, not only threats, um, as I said, outside and surrounding the Empire of all different varieties, but even within the Empire itself, and even within the, some of the Empire's strongest cities, you never quite know who is the villain. You never quite know when some when a villain is going to spring up, what he's going to do, um, and what you're going to have to um, uh, do uh, lower yourself to in order to stop him, or you know at least uh, outrun the uh, your friends, you know as it were. Uh, you don't have to be faster than the than the villain. You just have to be faster than one other person, um, and. Um, so that's kind of like the, the theme of, the, of Warhammer is that not only is the world dangerous in general in, term, in terms of immediate, obvious, external threats, but that every day um, is, yields the possibility of you know, strange revelations of you know, the, the fishwife down the street is actually a cultist and she's worshiping an ancient evil god or something like that. Or um, you know, the, that these supposedly kind of safe little nooks of civilization could be decimated at any time by various numbers of forces. Um, and some of those forces, and one of the most significant kind of great evil forces, if you would call it that, that persists in the Warhammer setting is the, the concept of chaos. And chaos, specifically in Warhammer, is represents kind of, uh, maybe you might liken it to the dark side in Star Wars, in that it's, it's this kind of ever-present energy that it permeates the world, and it warps, and it twists, and it mutates things, and it's associated with, uh, generally with, the four chaos gods. Um, these are four kind of ancient, evil, you know, um, deities that represent you know, uh, plague and, uh, you know, mutation and, uh, you know, these horrible excesses. And there are cults that, that secretly worship these gods and they try to, you know, bring their glory into the world and spread the madness and, and you know, whatnot, as it were. <clears throat> and so chaos is a, is a kind of a, depending on the edition of the game that you're talking about, it is played up to a greater or lesser degree, but chaos um, is represented not only by cults and, and by weird, you know, strange kind of mutant monstrous creatures, but, you know, even kind of rumors to the far north of uh, basically entire armies of, of you know, villages and, and cities of humans who are kind of slaves to this chaos power and it has warped them and created them into you know into horrific barbarians that will just sack towns and and uh, you know basically do whatever it is that they feel um, they need to do to appease their their gods um, but other than chaos and all that that's uh, that entails um, including the I didn't name the four chaos gods but very quickly um, the four chaos gods are Korn, who is the the blood god, basically a god of kind of murder and rampage and just wanton destruction. And then there's Nurgle, who is <clears throat> the fly lord, the god of plagues and disease and <clears throat> excuse me, 
and um, you know all kind of unmentionable you know nasty things and then there is uh, Zinch who is the sort of the god of magic but also the god of change and he just represents uh, more than any of the others, he, he generally represents kind of the chaotic nature of like sudden mutations and horrible monstrosities and tentacled, you know, uh, crazy beasts. Um, and then finally you have uh, Selenesh, who is the, uh, I forget some of his nicknames, but basically he is a very hedonistic god who is basically the god of pleasures. Um, of various, you know, everything that uh, that in, uh, might imply, both uh, maybe pleasures of the flesh, but also, um, um, you know, the pleasure of a um, of a serial killer, the the thrill that he gets when he murders somebody and and you know maybe tastes their blood or something like that. But basically, hedonism is his domain, and. Um, so not only do you have kind of these chaos forces that are that are generally, um, if not ever present, they're they're lurking and looming over and overshadowing everything, kind of giving a sinister taint to everything. Um, but you also have um, greenskins, your your standard orcs and goblins, um, who live in forest forest and mountainous regions and all around the empire and are general threat. You wouldn't even call them, you'd call them more significant than a nuisance because even a single warband of orcs um, that decides to trudge through a village is going to pretty much lay waste to anything that they that they set their sights to. Of course, the trick to, um, or, and the fun of uh, orcs and goblins is that they're, they are eternally quarreling with each other and so it, it only ta it's only when some kind of significant personality um, it kind of takes charge that they can focus their energy effectively enough in one direction to be as destructive. Um, but you have other um, other um, elements like beast men who are kind of half men, half half animal um, uh, creatures mutated by chaos energies that kind of live in the forest and they you know are const a constant problem for traveling caravans and small villages and that sort of thing. Um, and you have a lot of other forces as as well, um, and there's just a lot of rich backstory to Warhammer, and a lot of Warhammer is kind of this. The setting is kind of tied to the concept of chaos in two greater or lesser extents. Chaos has really shaped the world very significantly, um, and has created a lot of uh, history and a lot of kind of um, different factions and different kind of kind of concepts. But the existence of chaos is basically responsible for the existence of magic in Warhammer. Magic would not exist without the energies of chaos, or at least the current magical. So the current magical theory kind of states that um, the the magic is a very interesting part of Warhammer fantasy, and probably one of my favorite variations thematically on, say, a standard Dungeons and Dragons fantasy, because. Magic and wizards in Warhammer, at least human wizards, are specifically have to be kind of aligned to one of eight winds of magic. Uh, again, this was something that this was a mechanism that kind of evolved around the time of um, second edition or just before the second edition of the role playing game released. They changed kind of the essence of magic. They they kind of rewrote how magic worked, um, and so. I'm going to talk about magic here in a second, uh, both arcane and divine as it exists in Warhammer.